thank you so much for that beautiful um, introduction, Grace. Thank you. I see the claps. I see the claps. <laughs> thank you. Um, so first of all, yeah, I owe a great deal to um, Madam Marie Clark. She taught me so much. I was able to study with her for like, I think eight and a half or nine years before I got to college. She was my only piano instructor before I got to college. And um, between her uh, curriculum, you know, we worked out at the basic or Alfred's basic piano books and just her personal encouragement. Um, she really steered and had a huge influence on my musical trajectory. When I got to college, I ended up uh, studying composition and the judge for the composition festival when I was still, you know, a high schooler was uh, like the main composition coordinator at Metro. So it's just crazy how things worked out. And I wasn't even trying to compose uh, for the festival, but Mrs. Clark like insisted, you've got something, work on that. And so my degree, even though I play a lot of piano is in music composition. Um, so I have a lot to say today. <laughs> And so I think it would be prudent for me to jump right in into this presentation. And I'll tell you a little more about myself and how I started piano um, throughout the presentation here. So let me share the screen. Can we all see that okay? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So um, preparing for this presentation, I knew that I was going to speak to um, something related to music and the Black experience, right? And so I wanted to specify it a little more um, with my sort of personal background and uh, tradition that I was trained under. So the title of this presentation is Kojic Music Education, Experiential Training Ground for Musicians. And for those who may not know what Kojic is, that stands for Church of God in Christ. Um, I already gave a little background as to um, where I come from in my uh, training, but I do wanna say I started piano lessons at nine. Um, my parents tried to give me a lessons at five and I just wasn't feeling it. I took one lesson with this lady from Montbello. I won't name her name. Uh, but <laughs> apparently after the lesson, uh, I told my mom, nah, I'm not really feeling it. So for four years, I was just tinkering around the piano doing my own thing. But at nine, that's when my parents realized, you got something, you should take lessons. And there's this lady right around the corner, walking distance from us, um, that you should take lessons from, Mrs. Clark. So they bribed me with a PlayStation 2. They said, look, <laughs> if you will take these lessons, just show up for 30 minutes every week, we'll get you a PlayStation 2. And I was like, that's all I have to do? Sign up for lessons and I get video games? Let's do it. So I signed up. I honored my end of the deal, and on Christmas, they honored their end of the deal, and uh, yeah, video games was my way into music, and I remember, I don't know if it was like a year or so later, I was like, yeah, I think I want to quit piano now, and my dad was like, okay, well, if we quit piano, I have to take PlayStation. <laughs> so, of course, you knew what I had to do. I had to, I had to keep going, so... <laughs> Uh, fast forward, um, I had plenty of experiences um, also at nine playing in church because for some reason there was this other young lady who was the main musician and she ended up for some reason not playing uh, piano anymore at the church. So they needed someone. My mom was the choir director. So they said, hey, you're going to be the guy. And in this church... There was no sheet music. There was no sort of man any of any sort. You just kind of have to figure it out by ear. So I was getting a duality of training. One line of training where I'm reading music and learning like basic classical pieces, right? 
and then the other line where I'm just thrown and thrust into the situation of having to back people up by ear until I connected some dots between those two worlds. Um, so in a lot of ways, I'm very grateful for that. Um, I get to high school, end up uh, learning about jazz a little bit. And then in fall 2011, I enroll at MSU Denver. Um, I took three years of classical lessons with uh, Dr. Tamara Goldstein. I'm sure some folks know who she is. Um, excellent instructor. Uh, I finished my junior recital and was like, nah, I don't think I want to do a senior recital just because I'd have to practice four hours a day of just classical music. But my range of musical interests were all over the place. So I didn't feel like I could really dedicate the time that was necessary to make that senior recital happen. I just had too much of a respect for that music to half step on it, right? So uh, at the same time, I was studying music composition. And like I said, I finished my uh, the education with a bachelor's in music composition. But the cool part was the whole time at Metro, I was immersed in jazz and uh, between my church background and my uh, being studious in jazz, I got a job at MSU Denver and worked there from fall of 2016 to spring of 2019. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, as an accompanist, and I would also lecture some jazz history classes and stuff like that. So very interesting background I have. Next slide here. So a little bit about the Kojic Church of God and Christ background. Let's see here. I thought it prudent to just pull out a couple quotes because I didn't want to try to butcher the history of this. So from the Church of God in Christ website, the Church of God in Christ is a church of the Lord Jesus Christ in which the word of God is preached, ordinances are administered, and the doctrine of sanctification or holiness is emphasized as being essential to the salvation of mankind. Our church is commonly known as being holiness or Pentecostal in nature because of the importance ascribed to the events which occurred on the day of Pentecost, the 50th day after the Passover or Easter as being necessary for all believers in Christ Jesus to experience. And for a greater context into Pentecostalism, here's um, a quote from BBC. Pentecostalism is a form of Christianity that emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit and the direct experience of the presence of God by the believer. Pentecostals believe that faith must be powerfully experiential and not something found merely through ritual or teaching. Pentecostalism is energetic and dynamic. Its members believe that they are driven by the power of God moving within them. Um, so I was sort of thrust into this atmosphere at nine years old. Um, church was very expressive, uh, very charismatic and energetic. And uh, there's a saying that goes around, man, we had church, right? Having church really meant that there was a lot of energy uh, in the service. There was a lot of sometimes emotionalism in the service as well. But um, it was a lot, very bombastic <laughs> in a lot of ways. And so as a musician, you kind of have to navigate how to serve the music and to serve the service in a very, very specific way. So that makes this, mu this music very culturally specific. Um, so the primary emphasis of this presentation is um, a breakdown of the different musical skills that are focused on and cultivated through this atmosphere. I'm just very grateful to be a part of this tradition, but because it's so culturally specific, some folks may not even be aware that this whole culture exists. And then some folks may be aware that this culture exists, but might have some preconceived notions about it. Um, one fear of mine is that folks will see that there's no sheet music or they'll see that uh, it, it's, it's so rich in tradition, but it's so different from classical music that my fear was that people would view it as like primitive. 
And I've had to come to grips with the reality that, no, this is not primitive music. It's just different music. And uh, there's a different set of skills that are cultivated that prepare these types of musicians for even other types of cultures and situations. So uh, I'm not saying one is more elite than the other or that one tradition is better than the other, but each tradition offers their own set of skills that musicians can take with them uh, into other musical settings. I hope that makes sense. So the primary musical skills that we'll break down today are ear training, rhythm and hand independence, real-time application of functional harmony. This is probably my favorite point. Um, transposition and improvisation. If you survey these list of skills, you would think you were signing up for some sort of college curriculum. But if you think about it, this is all taking place in sometimes very small storefront churches. And a lot of musical dots are being connected in very low-key atmospheres. So I find that also very interesting. So the first point, ear training. Um, like I mentioned before, when I was thrust into this atmosphere, there was no sheet music. And if you were wanting to learn some songs, all you had was the recording, some headphones, a keyboard, and your ear. And you were left to just have to figure it out, right? Um, and it's interesting because compared to a lot of other styles of music, there's not a lot of sheet music for gospel. And I kind of understand at one point, and I don't understand on another point. I wonder if uh, professional uh, transcribers felt like uh, this music was not worthy of transcription sometimes. But then there's the other side where this music is so sophisticated and complicated that uh, just like with jazz, it might be weird to transcribe it because it's going to look very icky with all the complicated rhythms, all the complicated harmonies. And uh, it might turn even the best of readers off from trying to read it. So um, for those reasons, a lot of times sheet music is just omitted altogether and it's left up to you to like internalize the music um, that you're given. So a typical week uh, for a Koji keyboardist would be the choir director says, hey, Solomon, um, we want to learn this song by LA Mass. We want to learn this song by Colorado, Colorado Mass Choir. And we want to learn this song by like Shirley Caesar. I'm just naming random artists. And then um, before the age of YouTube, they would give us like a burned CD with the songs. Then it's up to me to go listen to it in my car, put it in my CD player, and just spend it however much time I needed to spend to make sure I internalize the harmonies, the melody of that song so that I could play it recognizable enough for the folks to sing along to. Um, but then there was testimony service. And I call that the ear training battleground because uh, before a lot of uh, African-American -Amer African churches uh, started moving towards a praise teams, there was this part of each service where anybody in the congregation could like get up and provide a testimony. And when they stand up, sometimes they're discussing, um, they're giving a testimony of great things that God has done for them and things that God has blessed them with. Hey, I'm just grateful to God that I was able to get a new house or I got a new car or that my son just made it to college or something. Um, but sometimes somebody will stand up and just start singing out of nowhere because they felt there was a song in their heart that they had to sing. And then it's up to you as the keyboardist to find their key. <laughs> First of all, recognize the song, find the key that they're singing in, and then try to jump in to accompany them as soon as possible. Right. And they don't give you a notice. They don't come up to you before service and say, hey, Solomon, I'm about to sing uh, Amazing Grace. Can you can you prepare that? Just get that, get that ready. You just have to go for it. So at nine, I just have to figure this out. And so I wanted to try something today. 
Um, I wanted to do a Zoom testimony service. Just real quick. Where someone, I don't care how good or bad your singing is, I want you to start singing a nursery, nursery rhyme. And it'll be up to me <laughs> to try to see if I recognize the nursery rhyme. And then I got to find your key. And then when I find it, then you can stop singing because we can't play at the same time. But let's try it. Who wants to volunteer first? Okay, so how about hickory dickory dock, the mouse went out up the clock. Okay. The... It's somewhere between D and E flat, right? Right? So I just have to yeah. figure it out, right? Um, beautiful. Let's let's do another one. Yuri. Sweetly sings the donkey at the break of day. If you do not feed him, this is what he'll say. Hee ha, hee ha, hee ha, hee ha, hee ha. Something like that, right? Okay, let's do two more. I just remember when that time when um, President Obama spoke at the um, memorial service for the people that were that were killed in uh, was it not Charlottesville, um, but in, at, at any rate, and he started singing um, "Amazing Grace." Yeah, and. It, take long for that pianist to be able to pick up his key and every <laughs> jumped right in. I and there was this long silence before he started to sing. And uh, they people were asking him, what were you thinking about in that long time? He said, I was trying to figure out what key I should take it in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, can someone start singing Amazing Grace in any key? Amazing Grace, how sweet. Beautiful, beautiful. So it's one of those things, you don't need perfect pitch to make this happen. Um, and a lot of folks do this and, and don't even realize it's happening. You kind of have to recognize the song. And then as the vocalist is singing, you're registering the scale degrees of the melody in your head. And somehow internally, you know how all those notes of the melody fit into one key. So now all you have to do is find the key center, the tonic. And from there, you're cooking. So I just thought that was cool to demonstrate that real quick. Beautiful, beautiful singing, everybody. Thank you. All right, let's go back to. So testimony service, the ear training battleground. Now, another skill that is developed within the Kojic church is uh, sophisticated rhythms and hand independence. So, of course, in traditional gospel, there's already a great deal of syncopation, uh, especially when playing congr congregational music or shout music. Congregational music is like this uh, this two beat type of feel. Um, I guess I have a piano; I could play it. Right, there's a lot of that type of uh, sound in um, the Kojic church, but then there's shout music as well, uh, which kind of derives rhythmically from congregational music, but it's way faster. <laughs> Stuff like that, right? Um, but there's different formats in which shout music can be played. For example, if there, if you're just the pianist at the church and there's no drummer and there's no bassist, 
then you're responsible for representing the whole rhythm section on your instrument and making the rhythm feel good. In fact, so good that folks feel comfortable enough to dance for God <laughs> while you play. And so if your time is whack, if you can't play to a metronome very well, it's going to show. And then folks are going to look at you sideways because you're not demonstrating um, some sort of comfortability with consistency when it comes to time. Um, and then, of course, left hand is the bass player. And then the right hand can represent the rhythm guitar. Oh, you guys don't need to see my hands, do you? Okay. We're good. All right, cool, cool, cool. Uh. And so just right there, uh, you see a great deal of syncopation. Syncopation. Wow. That's a new word. <laughs> syncopation uh, between the left hand and the right hand. Um, and it's musically demanding. That's not something that we would typically start off um, our kids learning. But if you're thrust into the situation, that's what you have to do. Now, I want to show a YouTube video of someone playing uh, shout music with an actual bass player. And I want you to note the sophistication of the rhythm and the interplay between the left hand and the right hand, okay? All right. Wow. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's, That's all right. Pretty That's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a typical Sunday. Just a typical Sunday. If we need to um, shout, if folks feel like dancing, the bass player is covering the low frequencies, and that frees up the pianist to really do some very complicated uh, rhythms. And if you look at Dave Jackson's face while he's playing, he's just having a blast. He's really going for stuff. It's not perfect, but it's definitely like deep. It's deep. And even if you slow it down, which we can do on YouTube, you can really see just the interplay between the two, the, between the two hands. It's amazing. Um, now, there's <laughs> another element to gospel piano, right? And that is the variable of the Hammond organ, right? So it's it's weird. We if you're gonna if you're gonna play Hammond organ, then there's even more independence that you have to embody between the limbs. Um, I'm not a pipe organ player, so I'm just gonna speak to the Hammond organ and what that deals with. Your right hand is controlling, or the right foot is controlling the expression pedal, which is responsible for volume. Your left foot 
is covering um, the bass pedals. And then your right hand, um, well, you have a few different options for what your hands can do. Um, let's see, your left hand can play chords while your right hand plays melodic figures or both hands could create some sort of composite rhythmic texture as we saw in Dave Jackson's video. So I'm gonna show one more video of someone named Corey Henry playing shout music on Hammond, Oregon. Please excuse the sock in the video. <laughs> So uh, what are some folks' um, initial thoughts upon listening to that video? Yes, sir. Oh, me? Um, yes, sir. Yes. I, I gotta, I, of course, you get a kick out of the whole thing. You have, you have to smile. But I, got, I, I especially liked when it showed when his paddle was hitting like eight notes. He just had his foot flat down <laughs> on, a, on a bunch of notes for, for some kind of a expression, which I thought was really cool. Uh, <laughs> And and it reminded me when I'm watching all of this going on, all these little, all you know, there's 200 things going on there, all coming out as one thing. I'm playing this cool piece, and and right. it reminds me of the word I often mention to students, if people don't know it, called obliterative subsumption, which is exactly the word for what was happening. There's hundreds of things involved in what was going on, but all that matters is the result was. I am playing this piece. Absolutely, absolutely. There's there's too many variables moving at one time, but he makes it look very, very easy. And again, like I said, this is a typical Sunday. That's just a part of the job description. If you're gonna sign up to be an organist uh, for Ebenezer Church of God in Christ on this you know, corner of Parker and Havana, I'm just naming streets, right? This is the a part of the job description. And it's cool because uh, compared to a lot of other churches that don't have or don't require this special skill set, uh, uh, the churches pay comparably well. It's, it's, it's a pretty good gig, but it's a very specialized type of job description. Solomon. Um, thoughts. So Solomon, I'm, what I'm wondering is, you know, you're talking about Church of God in Christ. Right. I mean, what about AME churches and other black, I'm sure there are many different kinds of black churches. Sure. Um, is particular to a particular denomination or is this just a generally black church uh, way of providing music? And That's an excellent question. 
my question also. Is he ever have any white guys come in and are able to do this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised at that. <laughs> yeah, because um, I'll start with the second question. I think folks think that it's inherently like you have to be black to really embody the sound of uh, Pentecostalism in music, right? Um, but it's just like any language. If you, as a white person, are just immersed in this language deeply, and this is all you know, you're going to sound like this too. <coughs> but it's one of those things where you can't just pick up a book about how to play in Church of God in Christ and get it. It's not even a situation where someone transcribed in detail exactly what we saw Corey Henry do, that if you copied it, it would feel the same. I I hear folks like, try to do that but then you realize oh they they learn the notes but they're not immersed in the culture and so it's just one of those things anybody can do it from any background but you have to commit yourself and subject yourself to the culture uh to your first question i thought that was an excellent question uh this sound is not limited to church of god in christ you can found a lot of remnants of the sound in Baptist churches, in AME churches, um, and the like. But a lot of this tradition comes from the Church of God in Christ. And when the Church of God in Christ was doing this around the early 1900s, it was compared, or it was different, and it was a specialized thing compared to more of the conservative AME and Baptist churches, right? And so it became a thing where this sound from Church of God in Christ seeped into these other Black denominations. But um, I'm just grateful to have been a part of the church from which a lot of these customs originated, if you will. And I don't have time to go into the complexity of Church of God in Christ um, from a social uh, and cultural standpoint, because from a musical standpoint, they were one of the most forward moving, progressive sounding churches. But from a social standpoint, they oftentimes isolated themselves from what other normal Christians would do, right? It was typical if you were a Christian, you still went to town picnics, you still went to the movies, you still hung out in various common social places in society, but um, the culture church frowned on a lot of these uh, social gatherings and social uh, venues because they prided themselves in being holy, sanctified, and unspotted from the world. And so even though uh, folks like me were definitely not encouraged to play in jazz clubs and to play in other secular uh, venues, a lot of secular music, that sound creeped its way into the church. And so I still had a great deal of exposure to those sounds, but in the church, on the church's terms, as opposed to being immersed in those atmospheres. So that's a whole other conversation for another day, but uh, excellent question. Excellent question. I, um, let's go back to any other thoughts, questions before we proceed. Um, did you, uh, do you usually have an, um, an order of worship, um, the songs you, okay, they give you the titles and you know, or they write in, like say, okay, there's, there's a sermon or a message, a message. Okay. And toward the end, you start improvising kind of self getting into the chords that you're right. going to use right. for the song. And when the message is over, then you launch into an introduction and it just rolls along. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a great deal of um, communication that can happen in these churches, but sometimes it doesn't happen. Like the preacher will feel led to preach about a particular subject um, that may or may not have been disclosed to the musician beforehand. Um, and if the pastor doesn't specifically say, Hey, I want this song after the sermon, 
kind of left up to the musician and the vocalist, if it's not the same person, to come up with the most appropriate song to play after the sermon. Right. And to render it in a way that doesn't distract from the, the sermon's closing and stuff like that. Um, so there is a great deal of preparation that can take place. But in this atmosphere, you're also trained to expect the unexpected. Do you always work with a director there or not? I mean, is there a music director? Um, it depends. Um, yeah. A couple churches that I play for, I'm the music director. And unfortunately, I don't sing. So I get other vocalists in place to make sure everything is running smoothly. But then other times I'm subject to a higher up choir director or vocal director. And in those regards, then I'm just staying very sensitive to what they need in that moment. Um, more often than not, folks are very communicative so that I'm set up for success for these services though. But excellent question. Yep. Um, One more thing. Yes. Um, and so there is like in, in other more mainstream kind of churches, we have hymnals. And you can turn to page 267 and, and know the song and they sing it. Now, so you don't have all your music written down. So there's like a um, uh, set of songs that everybody knows, right? Right. You launch into it, they know how to join in on that song. Mm -hmm. Now, if you learn a new song, what do you do? If I have and you want to learn a new song, yeah. Okay. Like what specific type of song? Would it be a hymn? Would it be a song from the radio? Well, I, I would assume, assume it would be a gospel song. Okay. But I'm sure new gospel songs are being written all the time. Sure, sure. So, or, or I don't know if it's written kind of should be in quotation marks. Or is it all just total um, oral, um, it passed down orally? Right. For the most part, just generally speaking, I'm not saying that all Kojic musicians engage music only in oral terms, right? Um, I'm, an ex I, I'm a product of one who can read, but also um, has to engage the music orally. I'd say... Um, for the most part, generally speaking, if I have to learn new so a new song in the Kojic Church, they provide the recording, and I just have to listen to the recording. Like, that, that's the primary thing. And I've seen folks who came from the Kojic Church and developed phenomenal ears but can't read at all, but then it would end up playing for more, like, conservative churches that only read or definitely played a lot of hymns. And if they were told in advance that they had to learn a particular hymn, let us break bread together on our knees or something like that. Well, let's hit up YouTube and let's figure out how to play this song. Not the tu piano tutorial, just the recording of it so they can internalize what the hymn sounds like what the harmony's doing, what the melody's doing, and then you're gonna show up and be able to play it in whatever key that the congregation needs to, you know, play it in. So it's just a different type of internalization. Good Solomon, point. can you can you uh, talk to about how a, a music director in your church teaches a choir a new piece of music? Oh, I yeah. watched my, I watched Michael Williams do that one time, and I just thought it was pretty amazing. Right. So as we've established, not a lot of sheet music found in these church contexts. So that becomes interesting, not just for the pianist and the instrumentalist, but the vocalist as well. So the vocalists are also responsible for listening to the recordings and internalizing the melody, but also their specific part, which requires a great deal of ear training, even if you don't profess to be a professional vocalist 
or a professional musician. And so um, you'll show up to a rehearsal as a vocalist and the choir director or the pianist will say, okay, today we're singing Mary Had a Little Lamb. We're gonna sing it in A flat. Sopranos, we're gonna separate the parts into soprano, alto, and tenor. Typically there's no bass. And we're gonna harmonize Mary Had a Little Lamb with closed voice triads. Sopranos, you take the melody. Remind, I don't sing y'all, please do not judge what comes out of my mouth. <laughs> um, let's go to F sharp. Sopranos. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Sopranos, you got it? Sing it back. And then they have to sing. Mary had a lamb. Now they have the easiest parts, the melody, they're cooking, right? Altos, here's your part. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Altos, sing it back. They sing it back. Tenors. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. All right, everybody, put it together. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. Altos, sopranos. Let's isolate that. It's a great deal of that. That's what choir rehearsals look like. And so if your memory isn't great, you're gonna have a tough time as a vocalist. <laughs> and if your yeah. ears aren't great, it's gonna be a little tough, right? Because there won't be a hymnal or any sort of visual reference to help guide you through. It's just you and the director and you gotta be sensitive to what they're asking you to do. And you have to hear ahead. You gotta hear ahead. You have ahead. to listen like crazy. Like crazy. Ears on fire. Yes, sir. Ears on fire, yes. Notwithstanding when you have to jump in to find a key, um, with uh, the general pieces that you might play often, are there favored keys to play in because of the key keyboard player? Interesting. You guys are all up in my presentation. We're like zigzagging like this. This is beautiful. Um, yeah, if the keyboardist also happens to be the director, the keyboardist can certainly steer folks in particular keys that are their favorite keys. Um, but then at the same time, the mature musician is going to know the melody so well, so well and then consider the person who's singing or the congregation who's singing and then adjust accordingly. Like for example, I wanted to play Mary Had a Little Lamb in A flat. That's a common, like, the, the strongest key. Everyone's cooking in A flat. It's cooking in A flat. But, but my voice couldn't do it. So I had to do it in F sharp. <laughs> and it ended up working out for the example. But great question. Great question. How are we feeling? Should we move on? Sure. Right. Sounds great. Let me share the screen again. All right. So this is my uh, favorite aspect of um, church training. You learn me in a very fun manner. You're, nothing is done just in theory. You have to learn it so that you can use it in context and you have to learn it quickly, right? Uh, traditional gospel uh, is a sophisticated, culturally specific harmonic language that combines the classical elements of hymnody, right? With the blues aesthetic of the African-American tradition to create this hybrid, just specific language, right? And so traditional lessons, um, as a, I keep saying, like a nine-year-old student, right? You're going to learn out of a book, um, or if you're using Suzuki, you're going to learn by ear, but you're going to be introduced to like three-note basic triads, mm -hmm. and you're going to learn some primary chords, right? 
and then you'll play songs using those primary chords and stuff like that. Um, however, there's no consideration as to what level a budding keyboardist is at. This is the job. This is what you have to embody. This is the sound you have to embody. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We're not even going to water down the voicings for your hand because your hands are small. You just got to figure it out. And so um, if... If that's what the recording's doing, that's what you got to do. <laughs> and that's what you have to figure out how to do. Um, typically, just like Roman numerals are used in classical music um, to convey how chords relate to one another, um, we often use the Nashville number system to convey where we're going, especially when we're working with other harmonic instruments. So if I'm playing and I wanna, if I'm in C and I wanna go to D minor, I'll tell the bass player, go to two, go to four, F, go to six, go to flat seven. But then what makes it even crazier is that all these numbers have specific harmonies and voicings that depend on the context. So if you're playing like a slow ballad worship song and you go to six, this is what the six will sound like. But if you're playing like a more uplifting jubilant song and you go to the six, the six could be like a dominant chord. Here's a six, right? If I'm backing up a preacher and I need to go to the six. The six chord could be a dominant chord, but with a whole bunch of alterations. Here's a six. And so it's one of those things where you're going to be exposed to some very advanced harmony and harmonic concepts very early. But more often than not, you're not even concerned with the names of these chords. You're not considering it to be a A dominant seven, sharp nine, flat 13, even though that might be what it is. You just know it as this particular shape. And when the preacher does this, I play this particular shape, and then I go to this shape, and then I go to this shape, which produces this sound, which produces this feeling in church. So it's, it's definitely... A different type of situation. Any questions so far? Uh-oh. Say that again? Well, I, I was just saying that it, it kind of bypasses this um, it bypasses this intellectual um, there, there, there's a whole part of the mind that it bypasses. Yeah. Right. Right. And I had to wrestle with it. Like, just because it's bypassing the intellectual, like, codification of the sound, that doesn't mean that it it's less than any other sound, right? Um, you just, if anything, it's just a different relationship to the instrument. Just like when someone learns the C major chord, C, E, and G, all white notes, this is what it feels like. No one can take that away from you because you know that sound now. Well, in this culture, magnify that with everything that you do. This sound, or this shape produces this sound. When I put my fingers here, I get this effect, right? And uh, even if you don't understand what to call it, you still know how to use it. There's a quote from this movie, Drumline, that said, just because someone doesn't know how to read uh, the sign that says toilet, that doesn't mean they don't know how to use the toilet, right? So that's kind of how I liken the whole uh, shape experience of gospel musicians to 
maybe more of compared to those who read or those who like to theorize everything. Now I'm the theorist. I'll be honest with you. I love theory. And so I feel empowered to have the skill to name most anything I play, but that's not where I'm coming from. And you don't have time in these situations to theorize everything. All you can do is jump to what your fingers are trained to do in those moments. Um, Solomon, I, yeah. I just, I'm in awe about you telling us that you were thrown into this at age nine. And these are mm -hmm. such kind of unwritten nuances, what you just explained right there. How long did it take for you to kind of realize what you use when? I mean, is it just the doing uh, it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what helped is knowing that I'm not alone. I'm still a part of a community of people who already do it. And so all I have to do is listen out for what they're doing. And now my responsibility is to copy it, right? So there's a great deal of autodidacticism attached to this music where I have to figure it out by myself. I have to investigate the sound and um, learn how to produce those same results um, that I'm hearing. But at the same time, it is inextricably attached to a community and a culture so that I all I have to do is model what's being modeled for me. So I hope that helps. I have a Amazing. question, Solomon. Yes. I actually have two real quick questions. If it, yes, ma'am. So first of all, in your your church, and you know, I haven't been to a, to a gospel church, but I've seen them like on the movies. And you mentioned that the preacher or minister calls out a number. So the the oftentimes they're directing the a Hammond organ or whatever, right? So they're like playing a background while the preacher is preaching, right? Right. So is that is that common in your church that you know yes yes well and the preacher may not call out the chords you know the preacher if they don't play they may know what sound they want but at the time they're just responsible for delivering the message of the gospel in the moment and god said boom right you know like it's the call and response the preacher says something and then it's my job to respond hello how are you Oh, good to see you today. Hallelujah. Right? Um, there's all of that. So if the preacher doesn't play, then it's definitely going to be left up to you. But then there are some preachers who also play. And if they're micromanagerial, I think that's a term, then they'll tell you. Yeah. They'll, they'll call out numbers. And then the other cool thing about it is for both preachers who play and preachers who don't play, there's a great deal of improvisation uh, attached to the preacher, where if the preacher is not tone deaf and can sing, then they're singing licks. And sometimes it's implied that you want to copy those licks. I'm about to embarrass myself again, so please don't laugh at me. Hallelujah. Hey, hey. You know what I mean? Like, whatever the preacher does, you have to respond to that. Hey, hey, hey. You know what I mean? Well, that is, that's really something to learn. And also, did you have, Solomon, you must have had a pretty good ear going into this because to pick up on this, uh, you know, and I don't know, just generally speaking, I find that boys tend to have a much better ear than girls. I don't know why hey. with my students. Okay. Do you find that in your teaching? Hmm. Wow. I don't think I could answer that yet. I, I haven't even tried to correlate uh, ear training success rates between um, boys and girls. So I'd have to get back to you on that. <laughs> Wow. I don't know what it is, but I found that. And so you must have had a pretty good ear going into your nine-year-old uh, experience with your church, I'm guessing. I, I will say I agree with you. I did have a good ear going into it, but that is because my mom plays piano. And she would play just as I am on the piano. She would play different hymns and stuff. 
and she was very repetitious with it. She played it all the time. So at some point, I just got on the piano and I started playing it. And I don't know if I would have known early on that I had a great ear or that there was prospects for me to develop the already solid ear uh, if I wasn't in that, if I wasn't nurtured by my mom. So I don't know. I had one. Yes. If I may, um, you know, some uh, somewhere around 1980, Mark Hayes started uh, a, a solid uh, sacred piano um, degree at Baylor, okay. but I, I I'm sure that that it was not it did it didn't get into what you got into. And are there any um, colleges that that teach try to teach what you've been doing your whole life wow excellent question i love mark hayes first of all yeah. and when i play mark hayes oftentimes i see like oh this man listened to the sounds of the african-american church tradition and let some of that seep into his arrangements sometimes and the way he does it's very classy and tasteful i'm a fan of mark hayes um I can't speak to what's happening at Baylor University um, as to whether they actually have like a gospel keyboard piano, but there are programs that do offer at least classes on gospel keyboard techniques. I don't know that they offer full blown degrees in that, but even if it's just like a course, I know Berkeley School of Music has this guy, Dennis Montgomery III. This guy, he is a professor, literally. <laughs> but like he um, has connected a great deal of dots for folks who already love improvisational music, but want to explore gospel a little more. So these programs exist, or at least courses do exist. Um, and I think it's a personal goal of mine to educate already uh, budding gospel musicians while also helping folks who want to learn more about the music uh, help them and challenge them to look at the piano the same way a gospel musician would have to look at it which will take some uh, retraining some reprogramming some um, challenging your paradigms even um, but if you're open to challenging the way you already see things I think you'll be shocked by the results that you'll get regardless of your background, just because you open yourself up to a different experience. Um, it is already oh. 1131. So I'm going to fast forward real quick to these final two points. And then I'll ask um, the groups a couple, a couple questions, excuse me. Transposition, um, quickly here, it is not enough to know a song. You have to know the melody, chord progressions, and shapes of the song well enough to play it in not only in the key that is most comfortable to you or uh, in the key that you learned it in, but you have to play it in the key that is comfortable for the vocalist to sing it in. And I just thought it'd be cool uh, to play the song uh, Thousand Miles, I think by Vanessa Carlton. It's one of my favorite songs. So let's say for some strange reason, your church is like, yo, we want to do a gospel version of this song. And so you practice it. You're feeling good about yourself. You learn the lick. Everybody's happy until you show up and you realize it's actually going to be a guy singing it. And the original key of B is not going to work. He's like, yeah, um, actually, can you do it in F sharp? And you're like, but I learned it in B. And so a couple things can happen. One, you gained enough skills to be able to transpose it. Oh, you know what? I thought I wanted F sharp. Can we do it in E? Okay. Right. Or this is the interesting thing. A lot of gospel keyboardists 
um, don't play acoustic pianos. They play keyboards. And these keyboards have the transpose button, which allows you to play most anything you want to play in your favorite key or the key that you've already learned all your shapes and your harmonic relationships in. But what's interesting, there's like this huge beef between those who use the transpose button in church and those who prefer to just learn everything in the in their respective keys without using the transpose button. Um, but I grew up in this collective of churches with this guy named Calvin Kennedy. And Calvin, even though he could play kind of in all his keys, his favorite key was C. So he would play this chord Triton and no matter what the singer or preacher was uh, singing or playing in, he would play in C and then use the transpose button to adjust the key. But there's something beautiful about even being able to do that, to know, okay, this person's actually an E flat. So now I have to do math on the keyboard <laughs> to adjust. How many half steps do I need to adjust this so that I can still play in C? It's a remarkable thing. So you have to be a mathematician if you're going to use the transpose button. And I have resolved within myself, I'm, I love math, but I can't do math in these real-time improvisational situations. So I've just forced myself to be able to replicate things in different keys. That's just me. Um, lastly, uh, this music is just full, replete with uh, improvisation from the different accompaniment patterns you play and shout music to different licks and riffs you can do in the end uh, phrases and songs. Um, you can take a traditional song that someone's playing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like Right there, I can go me or I can go like me. You can go anywhere, right? That, that's a form of improvisation. Um, backing up the preacher with all these different chords because the preacher knows that you should play behind him or her, but they don't micromanage what you play. So that's an opportunity for you to improvise the chords you play behind the preacher as long as you're within the same key center as him. And then last... Mm -hmm. Does the bass player have to? Uh, but he has to have a good ear to follow. If you if you want to put in a really interesting chord. Yes, but I'm not expecting the bass player to read my mind either. So if I'm going to change things up from how they would normally go, I got to give a signal, flat six or something. That say a wretch like me. So as long as I communicate these changes, we can cohesively um, improvise um, the harmonies as well. But then there's this phenomena in church um, called talk music, right? Where you're playing light, gentle, extemporaneous chords and stuff while someone is talking in church. Praise the Lord, everybody. We just wanna start off the service and we, we wanna thank you for being here. And you have to find a way to be creative so that you don't bore yourself, but not distract from what the speaker is saying. So I'm going to play one more YouTube video of this guy named Jaden Arnold. Uh, and disclaimer, there's a lot of annoying things about this video. The way the kid chews his gum, the guy talking in the background, there's, there's a lot to this video. But please just take in what he's doing and the fact that he's nine years old talking while playing the Hammond organ at the same time. This is a perfect example of talk music. Can we all see that okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right, give me something, Jada.
right. Please put this on Facebook, Doc. Dude, let me tell you something. I got like two or three videos already. How old is he? Nine. Nine. Jaden, how long you been playing? Since you was four? And you nine now, right? You pipe or something, right? That's what I thought. You from Atlanta? What songs can you play? Okay, I play by ear. You play by ear? Um. Yeah, man. What key is that you playing in? You know how to solo? You know how to solo too? Let me see. Yeah. Let me see you solo. I'm about to go in in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's wonderful. So let's just take in what we just saw, though. This nine year old kid annoyingly chewing gum. Like, you can't close your mouth while you chew this. <laughs> right. But playing these very thick, sophisticated chords with, you know, bass notes on his left foot. He, he almost looks like he's standing when he's playing because he's not old enough to, you know, confidently rest on the bench. But this guy is talking to him, asking him questions. And without skipping a beat, he is playing and responding to this guy. Hey, man, how old are you? Nine. How long you been playing? Since I was four. What songs you know? I play by ear. But you know songs, you know, even if you play by ear, right? Can you solo? Starts adjusting. So he knows the draw bars and the timbres of the organ so well that he can make real time adjustments to get whatever sound he needs to get out of that instrument. But this is typical. And so, yes, prodigies can exist. Um, musical prodigies can exist within any given genre or culture of music. But I'm trying to emphasize that this is just a part of the job, right? He's not uh, he's not an outlier as much as folks want to make it seem. He's just a normal product of circumstance and culture that demands this sound if you're going to cut it, right? So as I conclude, Um, some skills that you have to develop that will serve you well in life. Memory, because you have to memorize everything. Autodidacticism, that's my favorite word right now. Um, thick skin, because you're going to get disappointed a lot. I've had a lot of disappointments where I thought I was prepared enough and I wasn't, and I got kicked, to, kicked off. Um, and more mature musicians uh, play things I thought I was competent to play but you develop thick skin and realize oh there's a standard to this music and so I have to demonstrate and perform at a proficient level or someone's gonna take my job and I wasn't even getting paid at that time right but you still got kicked off um and then situational improvisation and sensitivity to moments um I felt like a film composer a lot of times in church because there'll be people at the altar crying out to God and really just trying to experience God and let the spirit move through them. And there's not always a manual as to what to play in those very pivotal emotional moments of church. And so you kind of have to find the right sounds on the keyboard, sometimes strings, sometimes electric piano, and you have to find the right chords that don't distract from the moment, but augment, that enhance that moment um, that is taking place in church. Um, 
I won't talk about myself today, but uh, because of my training, I have been afforded a lot of uh, gainful employment and opportunities in the form of transcribing music for folks, arranging things, and uh, serving as a keyboardist and music director for uh, this particular wedding band that, you know, wedding bands are weird, where let's say you got to learn how to play this pop song. It's not enough to go to musicnotes.com and to buy the sheet music to play it. Because one, it might be one of those whack arrangements that has the melody in the piano <laughs> and the vocal. So you don't even get the right accompaniment. But then two, there are synth parts sometimes and there's other parts that won't be found in the sheet music but you're responsible for replicating those sounds. So all you have to rely on is your ear to match the notes in the recording and the sounds to give that song the body it needs, right? So the three questions I wanna ask us uh, as instructors today, I think it's deeper than um, a race thing, even though this music is, uh, derived from the African-American tradition. Um, my goal today wasn't to tell every teacher here to start making their students play gospel. I think there's some bigger questions we should ask. Um, question one, what activities are we facilitating with our students to improve their ears? I'll give you my answer. Um, I played this game copycat where there's two keyboards involved I play a simple figure uh, in like a C position in both hands, and the student is responsible for replicating that same sound. And another thing I do is I have my students will listen to recordings, and I ask them to simply sing back what they hear. Because if they can audiate both in their mind and through their voice, what they're hearing, that's gonna be the gateway to conveying what you hear on the piano, right? And of course, if you're trying to learn a melody that's super fast, you have to slow it down in your mind. So that's where audiation becomes essential. So um, first question, what activities are we facilitating with our students to improve their ears? Question number two, how are we, how are we empowering our students to learn music without manuscripts. We have to be real and we have to know that some music that students are pumped about learning um, doesn't have adequate sheet music for it. And so as a teacher, we have, we're at a crossroads. We can choose to ignore that, say, oh, you'll figure it out. You do that on your own. Or we can go there with the student to try to figure it out. And you don't have to have a great ear. You don't have to be phenomenal um, when it comes to replicating anything you hear to do this. Be vulnerable with your students and try to figure it out together with them. I think that's gonna be more effective than you trying to uh, pose as an expert of ear training if your ears can't always level up. But uh, we, we need to empower our students to engage music on more than one level and in more than one medium so that uh, should they choose to become professional musicians, they are um, equipped with a well-rounded skill set that will enable them to work in a lot of different atmospheres. They can accompany vocal students for recitals. They can play R&B gigs. They can play for most types of churches. Of course, there's a cultural element, but you're equipping them to make money <laughs> essentially in the future uh, with the skill sets that you're uh, giving them, right? And then lastly, how are we connecting the music we teach to community and culture? Regardless of the genre, each, com each genre that we play has its own community and culture attached to it. So are we exposing our students to that community and culture or do they feel isolated and do they feel like most of their learning is on their own, save the 30 minutes that they see their teacher every week? 
those are my three questions. That is my time. Thank you for this opportunity. And I welcome any other questions that or comments that folks may have uh, before I log off. This is great. It, it's just been really, really great. You're teaching, you're, you're teaching functional, resilient musicians. That's what you're doing. And I wish I had had it, you know, in school. Wow. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Solomon, I really appreciate your program today. And I'm also church pianist. And I want to learn more about that gospel playing. Uh, is there any number I can contact you or email? Yes. You can share okay. with us. Um, I'll put my phone number and my website in the chat real quick. Okay, I would appreciate it. And then let's see, Mr. Gilmer also has all my contact info. So he could forward that over to anyone who may still want that even after the Zoom call today. And I'm sorry that I didn't compile a list of articles, YouTube videos and other resources that we could uh, read to get more um, exposure to the gospel community and music tradition. Um, so I'll try to compile those and send that over to Mr. Gilmore, oh, G Gilmer, excuse me, at, uh, you know, when I can, so everyone can have access to that. Thank you Great. so much, Solomon. Yeah. yeah, this is one of the best, this is one of the best presentations I've heard for our group, and I really, yes. really deeply appreciate it, Solomon. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and admittedly, it's oof, words. Admittedly, I want to um, join AMTA. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, Mandy. So let's seven. talk about how yeah. we can make that happen and what I need to do to join the club. Oh yes, I'll be happy to give you any information you want. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you all. Um, have a blessed day. And I look forward to seeing you in more meetings when I join. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, yeah awesome. Thank you.